From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Romulo Lulato on a new program called Wheat Rx, which will provide you wheat growers the very latest research recommendations for producing high-yielding and high-quality wheat through intensive management practices. Then K-State's Jeff Whitworth returns with advice for you producers on contending with this onrush of assorted worms that have invaded crop fields in Kansas recently, caterpillars in alfalfa and soybeans, and fall army worms and army worms in grain sorghum and soybeans. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd discusses several prominent insects now active in home landscapes and whether they merit treatment. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. Thanks for listening. First off here, information for you wheat growers. As we go along here, we'll put the spotlight on a new resource for you from K-State and the Kansas Wheat Commission. More on that shortly. But involved in all of this is our guest now, Romulo Lulato. Romulo, as you know, wheat production specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Starting here, Romulo, by just asking you for your general observations on the just past wheat production year here in Kansas. It had its highs. It had a few lows. What did we learn from this past production season? Hi, Eric. Yeah, thank you for having me on air. If we look back at this last season, I think that once again, right, we're learning more and more how resilient the wheat crop is and how much it can compensate for some of conditions that might not be optimal during the growing season as well. We look at the average state yield for uh, this 2021 season, and we were at 55 bushels per acre, which is near the highest that we have ever had in this state. Uh, And it's really showing a couple of things to us that I think we are reaching a new plateau here and hopefully not a plateau, hopefully we'll keep going up, but we are reaching new levels as as compared to a few years ago where we had never really surpassed 50 bushels per acre until 2016, right? And, And now a few years in a row already, we are either very close to 50 bushels per acre or we are well above that. So that's one of the things that we're learning is that definitely we are probably managing that crop better. It's also reflecting our better genetics. We have probably a pretty strong genetic gain in the wheat that year after year, uh, the genetic potential goes up. That's showing up in some of these yield levels as well. So it's just a combination of that better genetic potential from our current varieties and more attention to the crop by our growers. So that combination of things that we're seeing being reflected in this statewide average use, of course, uh, blessed by Mother Nature, right? right? (laughs) If it's not by Mother Nature, then we can do whatever we can and still keep some good use, but uh, we need the weather to cooperate. But most impressive to me was, if we think back in the fall and and how dry the month of October was, a lot of that crop that got planted in October never really emerged until, until November, sometimes even into December. And when that's the case, we say, well, our real potential is going to be really limited by that, right? Just because we don't have enough time for the crop to tiller in the fall, and those fall tillers, they are more productive. So that was the truth for a lot of the state, you know, except perhaps with the very far south central part of the state and southeast part of the state. The remainder uh, were really planted in October, but never really emerged until sometime in November. But yet, we were seeing some of those fields that didn't emerge until November or December, averaging 50, 55, 60 bushels per acre. So that's, of course, a lot to do with the good and cool and moist growing conditions that we had for most of the spring. Uh, they really helped the crop bounce back from that late emergence that, uh, that, that we had. I think that we can partially uh, attribute uh, that to better management as well. It's interesting because when we talk about better management, especially on these late planted scenarios, right, we go back to data that we collected in our own program from growers, data that we surveyed growers and just wanted to learn how they were managing their own fields. And looking at those over 700 commercial fields that we collected, 
The later the crop was planted, the higher the population it was planted at within the different regions of the state, meaning growers are paying attention to the information coming out of the university. They are adjusting their management practices based on their growing conditions. So they're planting late and they're increasing seeding rates uh, or in fields that had more rainfall, they were applying more frequently fungicides as well. So that was very satisfying for us to see how growers are paying attention and, and, and are adopting best management practices as much as they can for the crop to recover. Right. Want to move on over into something that you have just collaborated on with the Kansas Wheat Commission. This is being dubbed Wheat RX, and it is drawing from what you've been promoting for some years now and conducting, Romulo, and that is research on the intensive management practices for wheat. You've worked with growers, you've worked here at the university on test plots, and now you've collected that information to date to make it available to the producer. Definitely. So uh, I'm very excited with this program that we are collaborating with the Kansas Wheat Commission, right, as you mentioned, called Wheat RX. And essentially what that is, Eric, is uh, our attempt to help growers manage wheat more profitably and grow a better crop. And by better crop, I mean better yielding crop and better quality crop as well. Many times we think of wheat yield and quality as negatively related, and that can be true. So if, uh, you, if we have higher yielding conditions and we don't manage for that, yield and quality will be negative related. But here, what we want to show growers is we can be sustainable on wheat production through improving our yields and our quality simultaneously. So this uh, Wheat RX program, it will be a series of not only short, straightforward extension publications where we're going to tackle individual topics. So for example, the one that we just released this week uh, is on wheat variety selection. So we go over several thoughts that we have uh, collected over these last few years on how should we be selecting our varieties? What are the resources that we have available to make a good, informed variety selection decision there? Down the line, we're working on optimum planting dates, right? Uh, optimum uh, fertilizer rates as well, fertilizer timing and, and, and how to be more efficient using our fertilizers. Uh, fungicide management. So this is going to be a series of short, straightforward publications with educational videos as well. Which one of these publications are going to be accompanied by a quick video where uh, someone uh, from our group who is going to be leading that publication will just give a short two-minute elevator talk about that publication itself. And now it's important to mention that while I'm taking the lead on, on, on this effort from the K-State's perspective, this will be a team effort. Right? There's no way that I can do this by myself. Uh, we're collaborating with the plant pathology department, and Kelsey Anderson there is um, going to be taking the lead on a lot of these publications in terms of the fungicide management, collaborating with other agronomists, either in terms of planting dates or in terms of fertility management and so on. So really, this is going to be a team effort as K-State agronomy. Uh, how can we help our growers manage their crop more profitably? And as a region, we're looking to growing not only more wheat, but a better quality wheat as well, right? The loaf of bread is only going to be made if we have quality protein being harvested from Kansas wheat fields. So that's what we're trying to help growers do. Here. And at the same time, uh, this can be a program where perhaps companies who are interested in giving growers some remuneration or, or paying growers for like a quality product, for example, right? They could very well adopt these set uh, I wouldn't say a prescription, but it is a set of suggestions on how we have shown through research over the last five, six years that it's more sustainable and produces a better yielding and better quality crop that they could probably adopt these practices and help growers get paid for adopting some of those practices. That is good for everyone, good for the economics, good for the environment as well, and good for our consumer who is eating that loaf of bread. This will hopefully elevate wheat even further in stature as a productive crop in Kansas. And, and there is this interesting facet of the data that you have pulled together, Romulo. Again, you have worked with commercial wheat producers directly in drawing true scenario from the land information on these practices in those settings. And, and that really is good truthing of these practices, isn't it? 
Exactly. So uh, we, we many times we think of each one of these practices individually, right? So, okay, well, how do we manage nitrogen? How do we manage sulfur? How do we manage fungicide? But those practices, they interact, right? Many times you have more nitrogen, you have a higher yield potential, you want to spray a fungicide because you have a higher potential in that crop, right? Or if your sulfur is deficient, it doesn't matter how much nitrogen you're going to apply in that field because your limitation is the sulfur. So uh, as part of this with RX as well, we will tackle this systems approach, which is what you, you're asking here, right? Is uh, not only a one practice thing, which we will as well individually, but more of this systems approach and how are our growers managing their crop and usually how profitable is that? So it's a very exciting project. We're, we're going to be working considerably on this in the coming months here so that hopefully by the, the winter here, we have several other publications and videos out for growers because that's when they're going to be taking many of their management decisions in terms of fungicides, in terms of nitrogen and other management practices in the spring. So our goal is to really have a large amount of information for growers by that time so they can actually start adopting many of these practices. It's going to be a great reservoir of information for wheat producers out there. The first entry is already online on wheat variety selection. To get to that, go to kswheat.com slash wheatrx. We'll repeat that in just a moment. Thanks, Romulo, once more for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. He's wheat production specialist Romulo Lolato of K-State Research and Extension. And more on that Wheat RX program and what it can provide by going to kswheat.com slash wheat rx. Check that out. We'll be back with more on agriculture today. Agriculture Today is back now, and another roundup for you crop producers on insect concerns that you should be alert for in your various stands out there right now. Reporting, as usual, is crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth of K-State Research and Extension. A little something for everybody this time around, Jeff. But let's begin with uh, caterpillars in alfalfa stands as we're moving into the latter stages of the production season. What's out there? Uh, you say a little something for everybody, but there's a lot of something for quite a few folks also. In the last three weeks, we've had major flights and egg deposition of several of our pest insects. We're just now start as of last week, actually, we just started noticing it because as those eggs hatched and those worms or Lepidopter larvae, as they hatch and they start feeding, they grow. And initially, for the first week or 10 days, usually that feeding is not noticed. But in the last seven days, the growers and, every, and homeowners and everybody else really starting to notice the worms that are infesting just about anything right now. First of all, I'll talk a little bit about alfalfa because I've been looking at alfalfa, and they have been spraying a lot of alfalfa. Usually, a lot of years we get by with just spraying for alfalfa weevils. But this year, because of the worms that are out there, and when I talk about worms and alfalfa, primarily what we're seeing is the alfalfa caterpillar, the army worm, and the fall army worm. And it's kind of surprising to me about the alfalfa caterpillar. The alfalfa caterpillar is one that we have every year. They can be in alfalfa or they can be in soybeans. This is the white or yellow sulfur butterflies we see typically flying around an alfalfa field or a soybean field, especially after a little rain or after irrigation. They flock around a little puddle, get a drink of water, and then they go out and fly around and lay eggs in the alfalfa or the soybeans. Usually, there's not enough of them to cause a problem, to cause really any economic damage. But this year, the weather conditions must be just right because the alfalfa caterpillars in the fields I looked at this week, they're the predominant lepidopteran pest or larva uh, that we found. And, and they are kind of a neat velvety green with yellowish or white stripes. Right now, they're pretty much maturing 
any of these worms, any of these larvae, they're generally one and a half to two inches at maturity. So mm-hmm. once they start getting that large, they're not going to feed anymore. They're going to go pupate. And that's important because if you're out looking, uh, you need to be able to decide if most of the feeding's done or if there's going to be more feeding to come in the next week or two. The intensity of that feeding, though, can it be costly? Oh, yes. This year it has been. Now, in the alfalfa fields that we've looked at in the last few days, like I said, the alfalfa caterpillar is the predominant one, but there's also a large number of fall armyworms and even armyworms. Normally, armyworms we consider, or I consider, to be more of a pest in a grass, like corn, sorghum, or wheat, or yards, you know, fescue or turf or whatever. But they're like you and I, if we get hungry and there's only asparagus available, we'll eat it, right? <laughs> right. That's the same with the army worm. We've found quite a few of them in alfalfa, along with the fall army worm. So you have all three of these lepidoptin larvae in there right now. They're all pretty mature. They really skeletonize a lot of these alfalfa fields. And along with that, in many cases, fall army worms and army worms are doing the same thing on brome. Uh, We've received a lot of calls about brome because these are chewing insects. They have chewing mouth parts, and so they will graze off the foliage so that just the veins are there, just the stems. And one of the nice things about it, most of the time, these are perennials. So alfalfa is a perennial, brome's a perennial, but it still sets it back. And it still will reduce the amount you can harvest, you know, or you may even have to skip a harvest or a swathing or whatever you have to do. And right now, they're they're just maturing. All the ones I've seen, for the most part, they're maturing. When I say that, I mean the majority of the population. There are still a few small ones, but the majority are maturing. So as we speak, I'm assuming a lot of them are pupating. The importance of that is you don't want to treat. Some of the guys over the weekend, uh, they were trying to decide whether to treat their alfalfa or not, and they decided not to. And I think that's a wise decision. In a couple of cases, they went ahead and swathed their alfalfa because it was timely, and the birds flocked in, and the birds were really doing a number on these larvae. And they will help. But if, if the foliage is such in the brome or the alfalfa, the birds can't get to the worms. But once it's swathed, the worms are on the ground, the birds take care of them. But that's the consideration, whether you should treat or not. Another consideration If you do treat, and if your alfalfa is not ready to harvest, you may not have that consideration. But one of the other things you want to look at is the the post-harvest interval. Mm -hmm. With whatever product you use, it's going to have a period of time from the time it was treated until you can actually harvest it. And I, I highly recommend... Even if you do treat, you go back and monitor, but also look at the reentry period because there's also a time once you treated before it's safe to reenter the field to monitor, to look and see how well the product performed against whatever the target pest is you're looking at. But right now, the the insects that I have seen, they're going to be pupating in the soil, which means they're not feeding for four to five days. After they've finished pupation, they will emerge as a moth in the case of the army worm or the fall army worm or a butterfly in the case of the alfalfa caterpillar. They will mate and then they will start depositing eggs. And it takes, at these temperatures, four or five days, the eggs will hatch before the little small new larvae start feeding and start to cycle all over again. So Mm -hmm. if you do have quite a bit of feeding, considerable damage, and you're out looking and you don't see any worms, I would really recommend you don't treat, just hold off, go back in 10 days or 14 days and start monitoring again because there's going to be another cycle of whatever worms or the combination thereof that have been out there doing the feeding. Or they may go someplace else. You shouldn't just pre-treat just in case or in hopes that you have an insecticide there in case you do get an infestation. And this holds for row crops as well because these can turn up, as you said, in soybeans for sure. Yes. Right now, the problems we are hearing about are in alfalfa, brome, and the grasses due to fall armyworms and, as I indicated in alfalfa, the uh, alfalfa caterpillar. But these worms, when they pupate and they come out as adults, they're going to fly over to... Soybeans, in the case of fall armyworms, um, they're going to fly to sorghum. If there's any late planted sorghum, in the case of the armyworm and or the fall armyworm, and in the case of sorghum, 
the heads, the colonels or the berries, whatever you want to call them, they're going to be vulnerable to what we then call headworms between flowering and soft dough. So you have about a two-week period of time when they're vulnerable to these moths laying eggs and those little worms starting to feed on the marketable product. Around the state, and I've talked to several growers lately, the sorghum is a lot of different growth stages, even in the same field. And I think it's probably because of moisture. Uh, when it was planted, a lot of it couldn't get planted at the right time. Uh, so there's even in the same field, there's a lot of different growth stages. So that could be a problem. You don't want to spray it all at the same time. You probably want to try and make spot applications if you can or just get out and monitor and determine what your situation is. When we're talking about fall army worms or army worms or corn ear worms feeding on the head in the sorghum, remember it's 5% loss per worm per head. So it's relatively easy to figure. They will also go out and even if the sorghum is not yet heading out, if it's in the whirl stage, they will go ahead and infest that and start feeding on the on the leaves. Once the sorghum is past soft dough or into hard dough, those worms then, after they mature and become moths, those moths will fly around into soybeans. Because generally speaking, soybeans, you know, they're indeterminate. There'll be a few green beans or a few green leaves, and they'll start laying eggs out in the soybeans. That's when it becomes critical for soybeans if they start feeding on the bean within the pod. And they will do that, and then they become what we call pod worms Mm -hmm. in soybeans. But Again, they're feeding on the marketable product. So if you if you have one per row foot of small worms, that's, that's the key. you got to get out there and determine when the small ones are just starting to feed because once they're up to oh, an inch and a half to two inches, they're pretty much finished doing the damage or finished feeding, and they're going to crawl around and pupate, and then they're going to start to cycle all over again. Keep an eye on all of that, and in our remaining time, a quick mention, Jeff, if you would, about where we're at with the sugarcane aphid in grain sorghum. When you were last here, you noted it's been confirmed in southern Kansas. Is it on the move? Yes, it is always on the move uh, with southern breezes. The last I heard, the last uh, detections that I consider legitimate uh, were just right along 50 Highway, Highway 50. You know, it kind of splits the state. They're coming, and they just haven't taken hold yet. I've not heard of any treatable populations yet, and I'm hoping we don't, um, but they're on their way. Keep us posted, as you always do, and thanks, Jeff, for coming over and letting us know about what's going on currently. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, on this part of Agriculture Today. You are tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and on we go now to today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. The EPA has brought to an end agricultural uses the insecticide chlorpyrifos. In a final rule released yesterday, the EPA said it's canceling registered food uses of chlorpyrifos. The use of the product under the trade name Lord's Ban in agriculture had already dropped significantly in the past decade, particularly after its primary registrant Corteva AgriScience halted production back in 2020. But this action by the EPA effectively ends all agricultural uses of chlorpyrifos on food and feed crops, including generic products. It does not immediately affect non-food uses of the product, such as mosquito control, that will be under review later in in 2022, according to the EPA. Lord's ban, an insecticide that targets biting and sucking pests such as aphids, primarily used in soybeans, corn, wheat, cotton, and orchard crops, 
It has been a popular pest control option in the past, but its use has fallen from 13 million pounds per year in the late 1990s to 5 million to 7 million pounds per year starting around 2010. That's according to data from the U.S. Geological Survey. This new revocation of food tolerances for the chemical will become effective 60 days after it's published in the Federal Register that in the coming days, Corteva, when reached for comment, said it believes that the chemical should remain on the market despite that company's phase-out of their Lohr's Band product. Kansas City Southern has decided to delay this week's planned shareholder vote on Canadian Nationals' $33.5 billion offer to buy the railroad because regulators have not yet ruled on a key part of that acquisition plan. The vote scheduled for today was put on hold while investors wait to hear what the U.S. Surface Transportation Board will say about approving Canadian Nationals' plan to use a voting trust as part of the acquisition. The plan calls for the trust to acquire Kansas City Southern and hold the railroad during the STB's extended review of the overall deal. Without that approval, the deal may fall apart. The STB said last week it expects to issue its decision on Canadian Nationals' proposed voting trust by August the 31st. If Canadian Nationals' deal to buy Kansas City Southern does get derailed, the Canadian Pacific Railroad waiting in the wings with a competing $31 billion offer to purchase Kansas City Southern, the Canadian Pacific Pacific argues that shareholders should back its lower offer because it's more likely to be approved by regulators. But so far, Kansas City Southern has preferred Canadian Nationals' higher offer. The USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture recently entered a partnership with artificial intelligence research institutes across the country. With more on what that's all about, the USDA's Rod Bain. Future innovation in agriculture may have an advancement assist soon via AI, artificial intelligence. That's really going to be able to speed our ability to meet the critical needs of the future, our agricultural workforce, providing equitable and fair market access, as well as increasing nutrition security and providing tools for climate smart agriculture. And USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture Administrator Kerry Castile believes to that end, ongoing development of National Science Foundation-led AI research institutes will play a significant role in crafting farm and food-based innovations. NIFA is among the public and private partners involved in developing these institutes. We recently announced our commitment and our $220 million investment in 11 new artificial intelligence research institutes. There's a couple of them that we've supported through NIFA. Two institutes specifically focused on agriculture. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And on something of a related note, according to the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service, 81% of Kansas farms had access to computers as of this year. That compares to the national average of only 67% comparatively. Here in Kansas, 91% of farms had internet access. That is up 9% from the last time that that data was collected back in 2019. That takes us on to this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. And awaiting with that, as always, is Greg Akagi. Greg? Carlos Campabadal is joining us. He is an instructor in the Grain Sciences and Industry Department at K-State and also is the International Grains Program Outreach Specialist. And Carlos, a busy time at Kansas State in Grain Sciences and Industry. Tell us some of the things that are going on in the virtual world related to soybeans. Two things have happened. We started back again having uh, short courses here on site, more for our domestic uh, crowd, uh, more to the grain elevator manager side type of things. And then also, of course, cater to the feed industry. We have been doing our Fifth Safety Modernization Act uh, training where, where the participants get certified in PCQI. We also conducted our extrusion course uh, last week with our pet food formulation one. And also we've been pretty busy on the flour milling side, having courses uh, on introduction to flour milling, flour and dough, uh, with a few international participants, but not as, uh, as uh, usual numbers. But on the other hand, on our virtual courses, we've been pretty busy, especially from our tailor-made courses that we do for the 
the U.S. Soybean Expert Council. Since early summer, we've been doing, in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture Economics here at K-State, a training for the U.S. Soybean Expert Council America's office for the Columbia market and the emerging markets, which takes part of the Central American countries, trainings on topics related to agribusiness. So I, I like to call it kind of like a training, like a mini MAB program that they have. They take classes on their own time through the Canvas educational platform and then live sessions also on a weekly basis. IGP and Kansas State, we have been very successful in getting funded to uh, lead what uh, USEC has developed as the Soybean Excellence Center, which is pretty much a global educational platform where they like to get uh, participants get uh, be certified in different areas, uh, more like a professional development certification. We develop everything related to the poultry production and nutrition side. We've been very successful doing it online through live Zoom uh, type of teachings, and then also through the Canvas platform in the Nigeria market, uh, also the Southeast Asia. And uh, as of this week, we launched the program in the Americas, where actually IGP serves under uh, my leadership as the center lead, which means that we recruit, we market, we teach, and we've been very happy with this type of partnership that USIC has given us the trust and, and the opportunity to be part of. That is Carlos Campabadal, who is an instructor in the Grain Sciences and Industry Department at Kansas State University, also serves as an IGP outreach specialist, and he joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. As always, Greg, many thanks. Well, we talked about bugs in field crops earlier with K-State's Jeff Whitworth. Jeff's horticultural counterpart reports that there are insects stirring up some trouble in home landscapes. We'll have more on that next on Agriculture Today. To top off this agriculture today, it's our weekly horticulture segment. And back to our lawns and gardens and what insects are still getting after it as we're starting to enter now the latter part of the summer. Welcoming in Raymond Cloyd, horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. We can still, you say, Raymond, talk green June beetles. Are the numbers still hefty out there? Well, they are declining, Eric, and we probably uh, we expect that. I mean, we did get some moisture, but uh, what people were seeing were the adult males hovering around, and they made a sound just like a bumblebee. I was getting calls like that, and they're going to wait for the females. They'll dive down to the turf, mate with them, and then the females, and then lay eggs, and, the, and then later on this year, we'll start seeing the larva come out, especially if it's rainy. We get rainy weather, and they crawl on their backs. They're very unique for doing that, but they're really not a turf grass pest because they feed mostly on thatch and organic matter. But uh, just like Japanese beetles, we're seeing the populations decline. But then later on, you'll start seeing these black wasps flying around. Um, they're about three quarters of an inch long, some, sometimes an inch, and they have a yellow spot in their abdomen. That's a parasitoid of the larva of the green June beetle. So if you've had areas where you've seen lots of green June beetle activity, uh, you might want to look out for this parasitoid, and it's a good insect. So, they're, But they're, the females are attacking the larval state of the green June beetle. So having said all that, there's really no reason that one would need to confront these green June beetles with any kind of treatment or control. Not at this point, but we have had several weeks ago, they were attacking apples. And normally the, if a, there's a wound or something, that they will attack it. And what I tell the producers is just take a wounded apple, put it in a container, lure them, and then during the day close the container and it'll heat up and kill them. But green June beetle adults, just like Japanese beetle adults, will, will feed on apples and other peaches and nectarines and other fruit. That's when they're wounded. Really, you, can't, you won't want to spray, but just be cognizant of that. But both of those populations are, should be declining, uh, especially if it continues to stay warm and, and humid. All right. Well, here's a pest that we typically bring up every year. Uh, haven't done so up until now. Fall webworms in landscape ornamental trees. Yeah, the fall webworm is a uh, caterpillar. We have two generations per year in Kansas. The first generation, May, June. Now we're looking at the second generation. And really they're not going to harm trees because trees are going to be transitioning into a reproductive mode. You normally see fall webworm on crab apple, hickory, walnut, things like that. Especially if you drive the back roads of Kansas, you'll see the webs. And really they're not going to harm the tree. The only thing you can do if you have a young birch or crab apple that has these, just prune it out. 
out and destroy the nest. There's no rationalization or justification to apply an insecticide. Just physically remove by pruning it out, putting it in a plastic bag, and uh, put it in the sun, or basically just to destroy it. Now, these will defoliate parts of the tree, but the damage is cosmetic at most? At this point, it's cosmetic. They're one of the few caterpillars that stays in the nest, so that's why they're very difficult to manage with insecticides. Uh, you normally have to take a high-pressure water spray or rake to break the part of the nest and let the birds go in and feed on the caterpillars. You, you normally see localized or spotty, isolated infestations, and it's just as easy to prune them out than it is anything else, Eric. And keep your eye out for those and their activity. In the weeks ahead, the fall webworm. We've had this proliferation, Raymond, of grasshoppers <laughs> here, there, and everywhere, as we've discussed before. Will they start to decline at any point here? Well, not as fast as people would like, Eric, but they are out there feeding on vegetables and, and mostly vegetables, fruit trees and such like that. But the you really can't do much about them. They're so prolific. They migrate from other areas. Control weeds is one, but really you just you just have to deal with them, uh, knowing you're going to have the damage. You can't hire some kids uh, or anybody, at that matter, give them a badminton rack and go out there and swat them. Mm -hmm. But really, you, you just have to sort of live with it at this point. Yeah, they, they will eventually tail off as the females lay their eggs or, or their pods in the soil. But it could be several weeks before that even transpires. They're really so ecologically driven, uh, climate in particular, right? Well, temperature and moisture, like it, like all insects because they're cold-blooded. But this is the time of year you have plant material that is abundant for them to feed upon. And we have all sorts of different, we have a, a wide diversity of different species of grasshoppers in Kansas. And again, there are products like semaspore and nolobate, which contain the protozoa, but that's only going to be effective if everybody in Kansas used it right. because of the, it's, it's, it's sort of a bioinsecticide. And so it really, for you using it and nobody else in, in the county using it, is pretty much a fruitless gesture at this point. Endure them for a while longer. That first frost will take care of them, if nothing else. We whenever that, whenever that whenever comes, Eric. <laughs> this is a, a distant thought yeah, at the moment. Right. Last thing here, Raymond, cicada killers are out there in fair numbers now as well. Yeah, the cicada killer, of course, with the dog face cicadas making the noise at night, uh, we expect to see cicada killers. The The males are very territorial. They'll, they have an area, people walk through it, and they get very intimidated because they see this black, yellowish insect in front of their face. But the males can't sting. The females are somewhat docile. They'll uh, go up to the tree, um, grab a dog face cicada, bring it, into the nest, which is usually in the soil, the turf grass, loose soil, sting it, and then that they she provisions her nest with that and lays her egg on that on the dead cicada, and that's what her offspring, when they emerge from the eggs, will feed upon. Yeah, so really, it's the adult males that can be very intimidating, um, but again, they they will not sting you. And they won't inflict much in the way of plant damage anywhere. There really is no plant damage. This is an insect that primarily is a, a biological control agent or a natural enemy for the dog face cicada. Yeah. Yeah. So don't get too excited about those as they might be flitting about your home landscape. And to remind folks, Extension remains with a wealth of information for homeowners, for home gardeners, anybody with uh, interest in finding out more about an insect issue. Yeah, I mean, right now, the Extension Entomology uh, Group, we uh, have the newsletter every week or every other week, and that will be always there till about November when we just shut down and always provides up-to-date information, timely information on insect and might pass for both horticultural crops and field crops. And then we have a, a lot of extension publications. We have a new one out on Yonimus scale, which is very timely, that you can uh, download from the uh, the KSRE bookstore. It just came out, and there's other extension publications, and you can basically uh, go to the website, in this case, Department of Entomology, and, or the bookstore, and, and find those publications. Publications. If you'd like a URL to fall back on, entomology.ksu.edu is as easy as anything to remember. And we'll have you back soon again, Raymond. Thanks, as always. For always look forward to it, Eric. Horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd, K-State Research and Extension, with us on this week's Horticulture segment. And so goes our Thursday edition. We'll return right here this same time tomorrow. K-State's Dan O'Brien will weigh in with his latest grain market commentary and more. So please be back with us for that tomorrow. In the meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.